All right, cheers. Podcast cheers numero water. tres. tres. Um, One two. of these days, hopefully, I don't drink water. You're not supposed to cheer with water. Uh oh, what happens? <laughs> it's probably bad luck. I don't know. Well, so far, we're doing okay with ourselves without you ever drinking and us always cheersing. Yeah, that's with true. With your agua. Well, yep. I want to welcome you to another Flow Factory podcast. Cue the music. So, uh, we're catching up with my beautiful, sweet wife, Shirley Flores, um, so she could keep me in check and not from rambling too much about nonsense. I guess mm-hmm. uh, uh, something that hits close to home and a topic close to hand is uh, the recent Pan American Championships in Costa Rica that I was mm-hmm. part of the U.S. coaching. Actually, I'm the head coach officially. Um, sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but that's just... <laughs> that's U.S. Judo for you. <laughs> that way, easy. <laughs> um, so uh, we as a team did pretty well. It took six medals out of 14 weights, seven guys, seven girls. So there was two injuries, two players didn't compete, and Leilani Akiyama didn't go. She was just out of the race of points by a little bit, but she's coming down a weight class. Yeah, so. that's why you got to kind of let everyone know that. So she just moved down a weight class so she doesn't have enough points in that new weight class, even though like two weeks ago at the last tournament, she did great. And if the, I think if the tournament was like two months from now instead of last weekend, she probably would have been able to qualify. But yeah, um, actually, it was like a, a couple of weeks. She missed the cut off that tournament. So she made the semifinals of a Grand Prix in Turkey, which was worth a lot of points. And if she would have closed the deal and gotten a medal in the semis or in that third place match, it would have been huge. But it's just breaking into those rankings of the world rankings and getting into the working towards the top 22 to qualify for the Olympics in two years. So hopefully best of luck to you, Leilani. We'll be seeing you more on the mat and hopefully at the 2020 Games in Tokyo. But But back to Pan Am. So, I mean, I think it was a pretty good performance by the team. Um, How was the trip overall? I mean, you've been back for a couple of days now, but how was it? I I mean, other than being jet lagged, I feel great now. But the tournament, the tournament was interesting because it was in Costa Rica, which is beautiful, but I didn't see one rainforest. I didn't see one beach. I saw the inside of a gym. Uh, I saw the inside of a hotel room, and that's about it, mm-hmm. just how most judo tournaments go. It's wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, in and out. Yeah. And, and I feel like, though, sometimes they take these tournaments that – they kind of stretch them like regardless of what tournament it is and how many participants it is it's always going to be a whole day so like at the world it's one division women and men per day um and they go all day and it takes all day at the pan ams you have way less people but they have way less mats and they have this like ridiculous break where i think you were coaching from like 7 a.m. or like 8 a.m. until like 8 p.m. at night just because they stretch it out so much because they're just not they need to well I I think I'm kind of glad they did at least for one of the days because I left my suit back at the hotel and it gave enough time for the manager Lou (laughs) Moriman to go back in Uber thanks Lou (laughs) Moriman our team manager for making me uh able to coach in the final block on day two on day one, I didn't have any athletes uh, that were in the finals block, so uh-huh. it was mostly the the club coaches that were there for the athletes at the forty eight or forty two kilos, which is Angelica Delgado, Adonis Diaz at sixty, and fifty two, right? Yeah, fifty two. Yeah, what did I say? Forty eight, forty two. Oh, forty. <laughs> <laughs> Angelica kind of lose those yeah. ten kilos. <laughs> um, so I actually got a little break and was able to yell from the stands and my voice is still recovering a little bit. I think it's more effective actually being able to yell from the stands than in the coach's box. Yeah. Well, the coach in, in judo now has these, the, for everyone who doesn't know, it's weird. Like you have, you can only coach during the break. So like in judo, there's, it's not like MMA, there's like an exchange and then the ref breaks it and you kind of reset. And only during that time you can coach. And if you coach like during active um, competition, then you get penalized. Yeah, right? the referee gives kicked. you a finger. I mean, like, he literally like turns around, looks at you, gives you a finger, and then the second time you're done coaching. So for the whole day? No, no, just for that match. Oh, just for the, the match. The whole day is if your athlete that you walk through the chute, which is like that tunnel right before you enter the mat, like if you're on deck or on double deck, where you 
go through with the athlete. And if the athlete's gi is too small, <laughs> for some reason, the IJF referee panel of rules has made that something where now you're no longer allowed to coach that whole day. So if it's first match, like in Paris, the Paris Grand Slam, the biggest tournament of the year, uh, I was with an athlete. First match, I go out with her. Her gi doesn't cross enough by like a couple of millimeters. So they punch my card and I can't coach any of the athletes the rest of that day. So yeah. it's very strange, mm -hmm. but I, I'm learning the process. The more tournaments I do where now if I look and eyeball someone that's wearing a gi that might be a little on the edge, I don't go walk through with them. I wait until they get measured with the thing called a Sokuteki, which is like it goes in and it makes sure the size is, it's like is a right. ruler, right? Yeah. It's essentially a ruler that like they measure all the, the gi parameters. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I watch them go through and then once they go through, I kind of, trail in behind them rather than so go in with them try to avoid like them right didn't you like one time oh like, yeah try to get away from that yeah it was actually leilani the card it was leilani's gi pants looked like she was like 60 years old and <laughs> her <laughs> belly button was covered up by her gi pants for some mom reason jeans. yeah mom, mom judo pants. and they were looking at her like uh is this what you're really going through with and she kind of looked around and I got the out of Dodge, and then they, it was the first match of like the third or fourth day of the World Championships yeah. in Budapest, uh, about a seven or eight yeah. months ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which I'll wrap back around about that because um, that was one of the last times I actually that was the last time I coached these same athletes, mostly the same athletes. Mm -hmm. So I felt a little bit on the outside. Just basically, I hadn't been part of any of their development over the last eight months or been with them for tournaments or no, there was no mutual growth in relationships so I was just keeping a seat warm and making sure you know that they didn't get screwed by a referee and was able to kind of wave my hands around and give out f some positive reinforcement yeah. here and there rather than okay we're building on something let's try and uh we just lost audio <clears throat> it, rather than grow rather than grow together uh, it was something that was a little bit more okay I'm just cheerleading and hope mm -hmm. for the best so I kind of let that be known and I think hopefully some things are going to be changed and I'll get to be a little bit more of an integral part of the the growth process mm -hmm. rather than just okay I'm right. here let's hang yeah I mean it's like it's kind of crazy because there's two years and what in like two months or four months till the Olympics yeah. and so it's kind of like up until this point, the po the points that you gain at tournaments impact seed, but they don't impact the Olympic, like the rankings that impact who, what the 22 people that are going to the Olympics are. But now that it does, it's like, what's the strategy? And I mean, it's, it's tough <coughs> for like, a, I mean, Canada is a big country too. Yeah. And they make it happen. But with the U.S., it's such a big country that it's tough. It's not like I think about Israel and all the athletes just spraying in one place because the most that an athlete has to drive to get there is like an hour and a half. Yeah. So, there's, there's a know, bit of a disconnection between all the, the athletic training sites that the, the athletes, when they, they train where they represent, they are spread out all over the country. So from the East, West coast, North, South, Midwest, all that is covered and it's hard to get everyone in the same building to train together. So that's one of the things I'm trying to, to to mention and get off the ground is quarterly training camps regionally mm -hmm. where all the athletes that are on these teams have to to go to right. it and we'll hopefully get some good training together and right and also i think the athletes kind of like there isn't that kind of main um leader because i guess there isn't this like strategy for who's like us traveling as a team right so like athletes over here at this training center or athletes at this training center like they each kind of do the training centers or athletes do their own thing and so you don't have this like we're a team we're traveling with a coach to this tournament or this month that we're all spending together because like traveling around the world i mean you know it way better than i do but like as an, in an individual sport it gets really like lonely you know and so if you have a whole team there's that kind of dynamic that helps and it doesn't seem like right now U.S. Judo has that leader who's driving that who's kind of leading the whole team in terms of like this is our strategy and this is well there's something in compete. the making right now where there's a, a document that's being formulated that organizes the structure of how things are going to be mm -hmm. for the two years leading into the Olympics 
and I want to be brought in to be part of that process. And it would be nice to be involved at that level rather than, yeah. okay, do you want to go to this tournament in a month or three weeks? So I'm, I can only hope that that's, that kind of is remedied. And if not, yeah. then I, it's going to be an interesting next couple of years. Cause <clears throat> I have a, you know, a son that's young. We do. So mm -hmm. it's gonna, really? it's like, <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, I could spend my time one way or spend my time the other way. Yeah. But I respect every, all the athletes, all the coaches that come along with those personal, you know, the personal coaches with the athletes that help them out and they do all the, that legwork to get them to where they are. So right. total respect. But if they're going to, you know, use me for the world team coach, Olympic team coach, it'd be nice to brought, be brought in on that level as well. So that there's, like I said, that kind of development together. Yeah. Cause it's kind of hollow at this point where I'm sitting in a chair you know, it's nice to be respected and to be thought of as, Hey, you're the head coach. But I think it'd be, there'd be a lot more, it'd be a lot more gratifying on both ends. If you know, yeah, there was mutual growth. Right. And I think you'd be able to impact <coughs> like the actual performance. If it's a whole like string of events and, and coaching opportunities as opposed to just like, okay, so I know you cause I've coached with you before. I've worked with you before, but like, okay, these are your throws and I can only do so much to impact. Totally. Like, the match right yeah and you're especially not gonna take someone like the way i see it is like if you've got a i don't know a 20 percent chance like you're only gonna help like those close matches right you're gonna help them go one way or the other but if you need to build that relationship and that training and um coaching trust, trust with someone to be able to take a match that they had a 10% or 20% chance of winning and have them win that match, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I was a little frustrated at the world championships last year because we were planning on going to Rana's wedding and the world championships happened to fall on the same day. The first day of the world was eight days long, happened to fall on that first, first day on Rana's wedding in Molokai, Hawaii. And I made a decision to go to the world championships because on some information that the players told me they wanted me to coach them and I went and I didn't coach them and their club coach did, which he's also on the, the, the staff as right. well. So I get it, but it would have been nice to know ahead of time. So I could have gone in later. So I feel a little bit like, okay, I could go and help out in the back area and help get them ready in their warm up and do the things I could do just to be right. a team player. But obviously I don't want that to happen again. And so I think there's things in the process that, moving forward mm -hmm. won't allow that to happen I would hope because I've been kind of vocal about that but yeah I think being just a part of the staff and then coaching on game day especially with the way coaches have been kind of maimed as far as not being able to say anything during the match only during breaks where the referee says fix your gi or here's a penalty I learned to be really concise with what I'm saying but you get six seconds tops so it's right. kind of difficult to be able to make those adjustments on the fly rather than in training. Whereas in MMA, you're yelling during the whole fight, you're with that athlete for that camp, prior to camp, training during the season of of how they're getting better in different disciplines and there with them the whole time. So it's much more inclusive. Whereas this is like, okay, let's do it. Oh, Hajime, the ref says, begin. So now I have no, no more time to say anything. So I almost sometimes look to the outside and I look to some of the managers and other coaches and players that are there and I say, hey, tell them nice. to tell tell the athlete to say to do these techniques or to just cheerlead so that during the mates I could give this other information or the same information yeah. and reinforce it. So it's almost like coaching the other people from the same team to to be vocal, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Interesting. So, OK, so next trip is what? End of August, beginning of September for the world championships. That's your plan for judo, right? Uh, I'm not sure. So I don't know whether or not I'm going to be a part of like other team camps or uh, there's a tournament in Cancun, Mexico, which is a Grand Prix sometime this summer. And then there's this camp in Spain in the early part of July. And then the world team camp. Usually we had it last year in Colorado Springs, Colorado at the Olympic Training Center, which was a really good camp. And most of the athletes that were on the team, I think all but one went. And I think it was a good process of getting some camaraderie and being able to to go into the trenches together as far as like hard training twice a day, making sure everyone's making the gains they need and as individuals to be ready for the world yeah. championships. So I, I believe if those are the, it's the same kind of schedule, it'll be good. But 
I would like to I'd like to see some some something in writing almost yeah so stay tuned right <coughs> some things are it sounds like happening in the next few weeks couple months um there's some tournaments over the summer but i mean that's a big one right that everyone's kind of like that's where things are coming to a head is in late august with yeah. the world championships so cool. yeah well, that's it's good it's good to have you back home thank you thank you uh, me and my wife actually took a trip to costa rica back Oh, what was that? That was like our first trip. That was our first real trip, like our grown-up trip. We just, I mean, I, it was, I think it was like 2008, 2009, no. 2009. 2009, yeah. Like we just got my first real grown-up job. And I think I was waiting tables. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, maybe had an internship. No, no, no. I hadn't, no, I hadn't even no, gone back was. to finish school at Menlo College yet. I was like. No yeah, but that's when you had your internship. Okay, I had no degree that. from so college. So you were like making bang too. You had like a full <coughs> forty hour a week job. Yeah. And uh I planned like the whole trip. Like I bought one of those books, you know, <laughs> and back in the day when people like Pre smartphone based book. on like books <laughs> and yeah, like physical book. And I like mapped out all these places around the uh the I uh, the not the island, but the Costa Rica. And we rented a car. And uh, Justin, from his days of like <laughs> judo traveling, where there's no responsibilities and everything is taken hey, care of. Hey, I had to be responsible us. for competing, making weight, and showing up to my airplane. Yes, yes, and that's it. <laughs> um, thought that since we we're going international, um, having a, a license wouldn't be. A I brought good my passport. Idea. I know, Isn't that he's enough? Like, I'll leave the license at home because if I bring <laughs> it, I'll lose it. So we rent a car. I show up, and I'm like, okay, what's where's our car? They're like, where's your license? Um, and I don't drive stick. That was the other thing. Is and and back then, especially in Costa Rica, you wanted to have a stick, and I think that was yeah. probably the only option too. And we didn't. Oh, you maybe printed out about forty pages of MapQuest.com. Yes. Directions yes, to get the over the thing. mud hill into <laughs> the the beach or whatever. So, but we ended up spending at that time, which was a lot. It was like ten dollars a day for. Like an extra hundred dollars. I know we got a GPS. Thank yeah. God they offered it because yeah. I don't know that how. Been brutal. Like there's no street signs. No, there's no no, 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 no. no, it would have been a nightmare. But we um, ended up doing it, and it was great. And it was awesome. It was I, such a fun trip. I, there was a lot of good memories from that trip, as far as Shirley and I growing and having a good time and living it up on our own, like dime as far as being an adult and yeah i was like in my late 20s so <laughs> i'm a little stunted my my growth as an adult because i i was on the uh the judo fast track to not being plugged into society yeah. so i was uh, a little behind the eight ball in a lot of areas of my life so mm -hmm. it was good to get away from that and circle back now but back then it was good to just hey I'm not traveling with judo. I'm leaving my gi at home. We're actually going to do some real things that are fun right. that have nothing to do with being in a sauna and cutting weight. So we had a good time surfing, river rafting, um, zip lining, riding horses. Saw a bunch of animals. I mean, I'm a big like nature person. Like I don't want to go see cities or art or anything like that. I want to go like see nature and geology and volcanoes and that's like literally <laughs> what we did in Costa Rica oh yeah we saw a volcano days. and hung out but Shirley loves throwing out her back on vacations <laughs> so we ride a horse and zip line and the next day she's useless I have to basically carry her from where we're going to where we're yeah. going to eat to how we're, she was just hobbling around and things happen like two or three maybe more trips where every so time we go on a cool <laughs> trip we've been on some cool trips but every time I seem to do that it's okay though, babe. I still love you. Even on our honeymoon. <laughs> oh yeah, we were Fiji or was it New in Zealand? Fiji. Well, I mean, it was both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but Costa Rica, if you've never been, it's cool. I mean, part of me was jealous that you were there, but it's cool that it, since it's, it's cool not that cool. I did nothing cool. No, that way, there's no, no way you could be I'm like, saying. oh my god, you're at the beach, you're no. watching turtles, you're doing this fun stuff. At least no, I was that's like, not what I mean. No, I'm in a hot sauna, cutting weight with athletes, helping them. Yeah, but at least I knew that. You had already seen it, seen it. It's, I mean, don't get me wrong. It would have been really cool to see it again, but at least, like, you've been there, done that. So I'll take you it back someday, maybe babe. It didn't, maybe it didn't sting as much that you didn't get to do much, like, there cool things. There you go. See? There you go. That's what I mean. <laughs> Misery loves company. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll we'll move off that subject of just fun husband-wife time because I don't know how many uh, – do people like hearing about that stuff? Is that like the interpersonal relationship dynamics? It's probably kind of boring and bland. So let's move on. Um, 
So what I wanted to ask you about, because I thought it was kind of interesting, um, we listen to the MMA Hour, Ariel Hawani. Um, I don't have Twitter, but it's the one account on Twitter I actually look at, check out, because I think, I don't know, I think it's interesting. Um, I think he's done pretty well, and I think he's, he's pretty a, good He's the best journalist, journalist in, the, in the biz as far as mixed yeah. martial arts is oh, concerned. Sure. Maybe one day we'll have him here. Yes, we'll have him at the Flow yeah. Factory, have him oh, under the lights. Oh, yeah. But he had... Um, he had Kayla Harrison on, yes. you know, because she's obviously a two-time gold um, medalist at the Olympics in judo, and she's now transitioning over to MMA. Um, I think we both know her. You know, I kind of actually, as I was moving out of Boston um, when I was in college, she started training at Jimmy Pedro's. Um, so, you know, I yeah, not very close with her. I mean, I think you are more, but... She was on Ariel Alwani um, yesterday. I thought she did a really good job. I'm excited to see her do MMA. Um, yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts, and I had a question for you about just the interview. Yeah, in I mean, I'm really excited to see her be able to grow and develop and be, like, probably the best 145 on the planet. There's no part of me that believes that Cyborg's going to beat her. She's a beast. Once the, Kayla is. Once Kayla is able to get to that level and get a few fights on her belt and – move over to the UFC. I think she's a four fight contract in what, what is now the professional fighters league, which was the world series of fighting, right? Which I designed a lot of their gear, which is a side note. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see her get in under the lights, see how she takes a punch, watch her get how she is able to tran transition from striking and fuse her grappling into takedowns and submissions. Cause that's her strength, obviously. And I know she's been to a few different gyms and has hopped around a little bit until she found a good fit, which she has now at America top team. So I, I was talking to some of the coaches that live in South Florida down there from that are part of the U S judo training staff. And they, they go there on the weekly and teach judo. So I heard she's doing great, and I heard some rumors of her sparring with some very high-profile fighters and doing more than holding her own. That's so awesome. I'm, I'm stoked for, for her. her, and I think give it a little bit of time, and she'll be able to be on top of that mountain as well as the judo mountain. So props to you, Kayla, and I think it'll be a fun ride as far as being able to help judo as well because right. that's something that judo needs, uh, you know, another – another champion yeah definitely so one of the things <clears throat> she talked about was um like how judo like how you can take judo and apply it as like a high level judoka how you could take judo and apply it to mma right and i thought one of the things that was interesting that she was saying is that like it's not necessarily the things that she would expect that she used a lot during judo that transitioned while it was like other things. Um, so <coughs> foot for example, sweeps for her, it was foot sweeps. Right. Yeah. And I could totally see that. Like people don't expect it as much. You might, you don't need to be like that. Have that same level of perfection to be able to execute in a different sport when someone doesn't like expect foot sweeps. Yeah. Right. But how do you think like, I mean, you have a lot of experience with grappling and judo and, MMA and you know coaching like within your level of expertise or your realm of expertise MMA athletes what, do, what are your thoughts about kind of how judo train like translates and yeah, how no, it can be used it's a good question there's a lot of layers to that I think for Kayla specifically the techniques that she used in judo are, are very gi dependent where she would do a lot of high grip harai maki komi and be able to use her strength of gripping the gi to be able to drag people down into groundwork where she would either pin, choke, or arm bar. And I think the elements of the groundwork are going to be the same, but the way she's going to take people down are going to be different. Like she said, foot sweeps. So to be able to apply foot sweeps and the throws that she learned doing judo, not necessarily the ones that she used in tournaments, right. are going to be based off of tie-up positions, which is more of a wrestling thing where – you can't get a collar and a sleeve grip in MMA, so you're going to have to learn how to do use an underhook and a whizzer and a pummel right. position, a two-on-one, a front headlock, double underhooks, and how you're going to use those to take down your opponent. And I think that's what she's going to be getting and be groomed in that more than anything is, okay, how do I apply like a level change maybe to a single leg to work up the body to get an underhook so I could then use my feet for a takedown mm -hmm. rather than let's just grip the gi and do hurrah. 
So I know I've seen a lot of athletes that come from wrestling and that come from judo and transition in MMA. And it's a lot easier for wrestlers to integrate the techniques right away because, you know, you shoot from distance and you're able to use those techniques to take opponents down. And in judo, it's a little different. But I do think the judoka coming into MMA, their striking game is going to adapt and evolve quicker because their stance, light on their feet, and gripping is similar in the fast twitch muscle fibers you use to grab the gi. You're not right. going in there slow like a zombie walking in there. You're, you're, you're moving your hands, both of them, really quickly. And I think that's going to pay off for her hand speed and striking because a lot of times you see – high level wrestlers move into MMA and their hands look really slow to begin with and uh-huh. kind of they call them pillow fists a lot of times where it's just not with There's the not same impact it, yeah right? so i think it's going to be i foresee her having some success in the striking aspect as well as the grappling so yeah. she's such a hard worker so i don't think she's going to have problems i wonder <clears throat> i think it's going to be hard for her especially at the beginning like say a PFL to get opponents yeah. like why would any fighter want to fight her, right? And especially when at PFL, like, I don't know if, if there's enough money on the line to help incentivize it. Yeah. I think that's going to be interesting to see. I mean, she said she wants to fight two, three times this year. Even Ronda at the beginning, even, you know, I think a lot of higher profile athletes that are starting out their career, they don't have that many fights under their belt, so they're not comp- going to compete against someone who's undefeated who's 5-0 and who's 10-0 and I think have a hard time getting those first few fights yeah I think she'll be okay in that department she says she has someone booked so we just cross our fingers and hope that goes through and no one gets injured or pulls out at the last minute she's going to fight in Chicago in a few months so yeah. I, the thing that kind of you know I'm interested to see her is how she recovers from her weigh in she has made 145 I remember she made 63 kilos at the rendezvous. She might have actually missed weight. I'm not sure. I'd have to check that. In 2008, and I was struggling really bad to make 66 kilos at the time, and she was in kind of in a bad way, and that was the last time she ever went 63, and that was in 2008, so it's 10 years ago. And how old is she, 27? Something like that. So she was 17 at the time. <clears throat> and that's the last time she's ever been near 145. And that was 138.7 ish, yeah. is what 63 kilos ends up being. So I know it's a far cry from 145, but she's going to have to get down there. And that's 12 pounds away in her lightest days, I think, from what I've seen mm-hmm. on social media and what I heard her talking about on the MMA hour. So, I mean, that's what I'm more interested in how she recovers. I'm sure she'll be fine, but getting out there, cage door locked, making 145. How she takes a punch, all those play a very pivotal yeah. role in how, su- how much success she has. So, right. especially at the beginning when it's like your first time through it, you've never been it. Every, it's all unknown, right? Like mm-hmm. that recovery from 145, the getting hit in the face for the first time. Like once you've been there once, then you know what to expect. I you ju- know, but I, I just can't right. see her like running from anything. Like, oh, I don't like this. I got punched. I don't like it. I think her hunger for success and the second place is not even uh, it's not even close an option it's not an option so with a high level olympic champion two-time olympic champion i can't foresee her having stumbling so i'm sure she's going to make mistakes and she's going to learn from them but at the end of the day when she's finished mma i think she's going to be one of the most successful fighters there is it's just you know i think what what's going to be the other thing that's that's interesting is, you know, I don't know how old Chris Cyborg is, but like Chris Cyborg. I think she says on, she's in her early 30s, but you never know. You never like know. It. Yeah, you never know. Um, but you know what I mean? Like Kayla is kind of chasing Cyborg. And at some point, like she <clears> can't, <throat> she's going to have to fight Cyborg in the next three, four years, four three, years. four years. Because yeah. otherwise Cyborg is that ship. But sailed. I think that's Cyborg's perfect. Gonna, yeah, it is. But she's. She's going to need to have that cyborg fight. And you're right. I think she's going to do awesome. She's going to beat Chris Cyborg when she's ready for it. It's just a matter of making sure that she's ready for it before Cyborg moves on. Yeah. Because like after Cyborg moves on, she'll always, as good as she is and as dominant as she is, she'll always be compared to Chris Cyborg, who has been so dominant mm-hmm. and so, I mean, essentially hasn't lost in, what, 10 years. Yeah. Um, and unless they fight each other, she's going to be equivalent and never be like, the best yeah i 
I or thought of as the best. Yeah. I think sh the moving parts of her having Ali Abdulaziz as her manager, he has a ton of fighters on the roster, a ton of experience, and there's kind of a, a, a close network of fighters and her team, her coaches that work with him as well. I think they're going to bring her along at the right speed, but it's going to be having to contend and fight with the powers that be uh, WME and the UFC trying to fast track her because they need Chris Cyborg. They need opponents for her. So right. it's going to be tough to fight all those things and the money th and the fame and all of that is going to be something she's going to have to kind of begin on a different level. She's done it with the Olympic movement and had a lot of success with dealing with media and she has a book out. So obviously she's, she's no stranger to that, but uh, just another level it, the yeah. machine it, it's a huge thing and i think being able to do it at the right time and to pick when that is it's going to be crucial can't be in a year it can't be in a year and a half it's got to be when she's ready and i i think she would do fine in a year year and a half but get the confidence get the experience be able to not be as one-dimensional as she might be right now as just a straight gra grappler but it's all kind of going to be exciting watching her yeah. take those steps closer and closer to the one and only fighter at 145. I mean, they mm -hmm. made a division for Chris Cyborg, and sh there's no one else for it. Like they they have to bring in 135 pounders to move them up, and they're all B level 135 pounders. They're not anyone that's. They're not the yeah. I mean, Amanda Nunes is probably the Amanda Amanda and uh, Holly, you know, are probably the the most like relevant 135ers that she's fought. Well, and I think both 135ers. there's other ones too. What's the, um, the one from Holland that fought Holly home and beat her for the first one. Jermaine Duran. Jermaine She was a 135er that moved up. I think. Yeah, but she was, I'm just thinking about like <clears throat> the, the high quality 135ers that yeah. she's fought. It's just, you know, to your point, yeah. she's not fighting like the champ and the number one, and number two contenders for the most part. She's fighting like your Leslie Smith's, your Jermaine yeah. Duran to me, you know, yeah, I just hope that uh, she does her best and stays healthy. And yeah. Cause no, she's, she's, gonna she's had some knee injuries, and her judo career is really illustrious, and I hope it helps propel the sport of judo. And her backstory is it's crazy. Yeah, if you don't know about it, you got it. We probably don't have enough time to go into it, but it's I'll kind of surmise. Crazy. So her coach, Dan Doyle, um, in from her career being in judo, under him from ages like nine to 17 or 18 was sexually molesting her on the regular. And he had her believing that if she told anyone that, you know, it's just impossible. She was depressed. She, she was having a hard time with that and cutting herself and was looking for reasons to end it all during that time. And it all came to an end. I was actually at a tournament in Puerto Rico and her, then friend, later boyfriend, and fiance, Aaron Handy, came to our room and knocked on the door at 4 a.m. Weigh-ins are at 7 a.m. So all of us, there was nine of us in this one room. In bunk beds. Bunk beds style. at the Olympic Training Center in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And wakes us all up. I answer the door, and it's Kayla coming to the door to get Aaron. And she's in tears, and she's 17 at the time, 16 or 17, and is just can't be consoled and Aaron goes outside and he, he's out there for about 15 minutes while we try and go back to sleep and he comes back in and says some serious stuff is going down and he's really sorry and uh, you guys would understand if you knew the depths of this so I talked to Aaron the next day in between matches and he, he kind of laid it all out on there for me about how what's happening with their coach and her coach was actually on he was on his way to fly down to Puerto Rico to coach Kayla and apparently somewhere along the way on the plane or he got stopped, he right? got stopped like and arrested. And I think that was the whole the beginning of the end for him. And she got wind of that and was in a really confused place at the time. And it, it kind of all hit her at once. So she, I can't even begin to understand what she's been through, right. but I, I really am rooting for her because she's come back from the depths of hell and yeah. her toughness and like her, the way she reacts to adversity when you think about it in like the judo realm is like nothing compared to just the things that she's D endured uh, like, in life. Exactly. So, I mean, that's why MMA, I'm sure she's going to, we talk about like getting hit in the face. We talk about like, um, 
the weight cut and all that, I think she's going to, at any point like that, when she's at a tough moment, as long as she takes a step back and realizes that it's nothing it's compared nothing to, like, that. the adversity that she's been through, um, I mean, she'll she'll be the best there ever. I mean, to was. relate to that, which is nothing in comparison, but uh-uh. whenever I'm in a tough pos- situation or I'm, like, a little overwhelmed and out of my element, I just think back to, okay, I have a son. This guy, kid is amazing. I love him so yeah. much. Nothing else in the world matters but my family and – but I can, it's very different, but the headspace that you have to go to, to be able to endure, like and focus in on something that this isn't a big deal. I've dealt with this other thing. That's, right. that's, well, that's that whole like, um, mel- mental side of things. Right. Where, it, you know, like, I mean, we have a friend who runs like ultra marathon. She's crazy. She runs a hundred miles. You Sam know, Bristol out like there. <laughs> you pray, but we love um, you. But <coughs> same thing she says like running 100 miles it's not like the physical thing it's the mental that's hard like it's oh we're definitely you know. gonna have sam on in the future yeah. and probably Badass. jeff her husband jeff is let's a little bit about both of them jeff bristol was one of my best friends and still is uh growing up he's a high school wrestler all american wrestled division one for university of davis uh he fell in to a spiral that led him into rehab multiple times and drug addiction drug addiction and had a hard time defeating that which so far he's doing a great job and props to you jeff and we'll have him in to tell us a little bit about his story and sam his wife beautiful lovely doing everything she can to help him in his way and they're doing a great job so super stoked for both of them she's and she's just amazing too she's the sweetest um friend i have sweetest person i know and um she's also got this kind of crazy drive to challenge herself deep um, fire that burns to run a hundred miles and swim and and ride a bike hundreds of miles yeah fun she she hikes 10 miles (laughs) my idea of fun run after she's crazy (laughs) um but yeah i mean the stuff that she she goes through says she says is a lot more about mental than physical even though on the surface it seems like a, a physical challenge so kudos to you guys strong yeah so i guess we'll wrap this up what do you think yeah let's do it so next um Um, thursday which i don't know it'll take a few days to get this one edited and then we'll have majid hagan who's uh one of the best jujiteros i think that's the way you say it (laughs) it's judoka so jujitsu cuz what i would think but they have he's actually sponsored by a brand jujitero so that's kind of like a judoka but for jujitsu and he's going to be coming on the podcast We'll get to talk a lot of good grappling and his his rise to prominence. And he's one of the best jujiteros I know and amazing grappler. So we'll mm-hmm. get a little bit of that flavor in here at the Flow Factory and bend his ear and try and convince him that judo's the way, not jujitsu. <laughs> but I think he's got like one of the oh, – I don't follow him on Instagram. Um, How try, dare you? Well, I try to keep my Instagram feed – short because as you know i'm i dive into my phone too much so if i have less people to follow it's less things to look at okay. and i have more time to spend on things that matter like my family and, he still doesn't know. approve of that but <laughs> anyways <laughs> every so often i i click and you know end up down the rabbit hole and i look at his instagram and he's got like this cool job that's not really a job like he just travels and he does trains, seminars he does and he seminars. does competes whenever yeah. where the wind blows he's there yeah. i mean great Talk. skateboarder surfer so he's a brown belt in judo i gave him his brown belt a few months back but he's been doing judo since he was a kid on and off so his stand-up game's no joke his ground game is one of the best i know so and he's really well traveled and kind of i'm sure gets to, to teach and compete and learn and you know see a lot of different you know, whether it's cultures or people or sites around the world. So pretty cool uh, little gig he's got going. Totally. We'll get I deep into to that. can't wait to hear about sure. it a little more. Yeah, it'll be fun. But until then, guys, oh, give you, us a follow. YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, subscribe, rate, um, comment, all that. All that good stuff. Social Please media, do. go iTunes, Call YouTube, Flow Factory. Flow Factory. Hashtag Flow Factory. You can find us on iTunes and on YouTube. SoundCloud as well. So, peace be the journey. Good night.